Now moving on further, I would like to request our chairperson, Dr. Pragnesh sir, to please introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Subhas uh, Vanganu. Uh, sir, he is a, a consultant endocrinologist from Apollo Hospital, Delhi. Uh, I would like to request uh, uh, sir to uh, start a talk. Well, a very warm welcome for the Swasticon. It is my proud pleasure to basically give you an overview of the breakthrough in diabetes, what we have learned in today's scenario in the management of type 2 diabetes. Now coming to the various breakthroughs in diabetes, let's start with the advances in the guidelines from stepwise glucocentric approach to the glucocardiorenal approach, breakthrough treatment options and the breakthrough in the technology for diabetes management. Now coming to the advances in guidelines from stepwise glucocentric approach to the glucocardiorenal approach, if you see the latest 2020 ACE consensus statement, they have given more focus on risk stratification rather than the absolute number. And the ACE is the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. And you can see the first is the lifestyle modification and ongoing glucose monitoring. And they have added the continuous glucose monitoring is preferred. Then independent of the glycemic control, if established or high atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and or the chronic kidney disease, they have shown to recommend SGLT2 and or GLP-1, long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist. So this is the two main statement of 2020. And what they have now shown that at the entry level, if the HbA1c is less than 7.5, the two main domain of the treatment remains the GLP-1 receptor agonist or the SGLT2 because of their solid evidence in the cardio renal glucose protection. And what they have seen that even the independent of the glycemic control, if there is an established CVD or high risk CKD or the patient with the heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction, they have shown it is always recommended to start either with the GLP receptor agonist and if the CKD predominates or the heart failure predominates, then the first line of therapy remains SGLT2. Then if the entry level of HbA1c is more than 7.5, the American Association recommends a combo therapy, that is dual therapy from the day one. And this dual therapy can be a combination of a GLP-1 receptor agonist and a GLT-2 inhibitor. And in the triple combination, when the dual combination is not able to bring down the HB1C, they say that you can add any of the other drugs apart from these two in the management of diabetes, including a basal insulin. And they again say that if the HbA1c is more than 9, then if the patient is symptomatic, weight loss, or the patient is having severe polyuria, polydipsia, there is no other way only to start the insulin. Coming to the new medications, the breakthrough in the treatment options, and the paradigm shift in the treatment, you can see what we discussed just now that the addition of the GLP-1 receptor agonist or the HGT2 inhibitor to the ongoing treatment regimen is recommended irrespective of the glycemia, that is independent of the glycemia. And you can see the HGT2 inhibitors are more indicated for patient underlying CKD, underlying heart failure patient with the reduced ejection fraction, or also to improvement in the CD death and also improvement in the three-point base. But the renal protection is more than the heart failure protection, is more than the three-point base when we use the SGLT2 inhibitors. 
Now coming to the GLP-1 receptor agonist, it's predominantly basically help in three-point maze or the CV death, followed by heart failure and followed by renal production, which is a questionable mark because we need to have more studies because there is no dedicated renal outcome data with the long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist as we had a dedicated renal outcome data with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Breakthrough in the treatment is the introduction of a new insulin. And this new insulin is basically being manufactured by the Novo Nordisk. And this is called the insulin ICODEC. And insulin ICODEC is a long acting insulin, can be given once in a week, where they have done three amino acid substitution to prevent enzymatic degradation to ensure stability and solubility. And also addition of a C20 fatty diacid imparts strong and reversible albumin binding and all modification contribute to the slow receptor mediated clearance. So this is the recent change where we can use a once weekly basal insulin, insulin icodec by no notice. Now coming to the newer medication, Again, the paradigm shift in the treatment regimes. These are the reports of the cardiovascular indication, cardiovascular update, and the European Union opinion on the basically the new oral GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is called semaglutide, which is now available in the oral form, but which has to be given daily. And you can see the Ozempic trial, which shown. Ozempic is the name of the drug, but the cardiovascular improvement in the three-point maze, the semaglutide had only 6.6% events as compared to the 8.9% <coughs> maze events. And if you see the cardiovascular update also, where they have compared the semaglutide with the standard of control of treatment along with the placebo where they have established a non-inferiority with the hazard ratio equal to 0.79. Rabulous is indicated as monotherapy when metformin is considered inappropriate. That is again another brand name of the oral semaglutide for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Now coming to the technology, the breakthrough treatment option technology. We have now the closed loop insulin pumps. We are now real time continuous glucose monitoring system. And the new method to see the good glucose control, what we call the time in range. If we see the latest T Slim X2, it is the control IQ technology and the control IQ advanced hybrid closed loop technology adjusts the insulin delivery automatically to help prevent highs and lows while still allowing the user to manually bolus for the meals. And the basal IQ technology predicts and helps reduce the frequency and the duration of the low glucose events. This system operates in the background without constant input. So these are the two important advantages of the closed loop system. Now coming to the time in range, which is a new concept of seeing the control of diabetes, what you call the treatment option. What is the importance of time in range versus HbA1c? The HbA1c basically is the predictive of the vascular complication. It helps to management decision and it is easy to measure relatively cheap. The only limitation of the HbA1c is that it only provides an approximate measurement of the glycemia, unable to address glucose variability or hypoglycemia, unreliable in certain conditions like renal failure, hemoglobinopathies, and other things. Now, time in range versus the HbA1c. So these I have given three circles, green, yellow, and the red. And this is the CGMA data and which gets recorded in the form of a bar diagram, circle diagram, where they show 
how many times your sugar readings in 24 hours were within the range time in range you set a particular range suppose here we have set the range between 180 is between 80 to 160 you can have your own range between 80 to 180 also so if you set this range on the cgm device like free the libre pro which has been recently introduced then they they will give the time in range here you will see the three important time in range the on the left hand the circle they have shown that particular patient was having 40% readings of time in range in 24 hours while the second patient is 70% third is 100% the recommended for all the patients who are having diabetes at least more than 70% of the reading should be within the range what you call the time in range which is a better predictor for the cardiovascular risk and the mortality as compared to the hp1s but nonetheless all said and done both the things are complementary to each other we cannot forget hb1c and start doing only time and range tir so time and range is important for day to day variability but the hb1c has also been shown having a clear evidence a link between the cardiovascular risk and the hb1c elevation right from the uk pda they have shown even a 1% decrease in the hb1c has a modest improvement in the diabetic neuropathy nephropathy retinopathy and to some extent on the major microvascular com complications so we cannot forget hb1c but time in range at least we tell us about the daily pattern of the glucose and it gives you more flexibility for the adjustment of the sugar by doing the adjustment in the insulin uh, reading now coming to the cell monitoring of the glucose advantage is no it is basically low cost the limitation being is inconvenient you have to prick every time and anti social CGMH is better because full glucose profile allow for the hypos and you can have a connection with the iphone also limitations the only high cost full glucose profile calibration fcmg does not require calibration it is basically full glucose profile no calibration long sensor use and relatively affordable what we call the fc gm so fc gm is better than cgm cgm is better than smdg so we can have a better quality of life with the current monitoring system before i close down that the technology not only has helped in the management of the diabetes into day to day practice but also the advances in type of diabetes had made the life of a patient easy the technology by technology the patient can record his blood sugar can send on the to the healthcare provider healthcare provider can have the readings immediately on his computer at his clinic he can see the cgm reading he can immediately uh, decide what modification has to make and immediately already sent to the doctor itself that is number 1 number 2 people are talking about the importance of the newer drugs what i told you about the agl32 and the glp1 receptor agonist the story does not end here the newer drug had shown a great promise of reduction in the hospitalization for the heart failure even in a non diabetic patient that means that these drugs basically also work in non diabetic patient because the mechanism of action of agl2 is through the inhibition of the agl2 receptor in the proximal convoluted tubule and causing increased sodium delivery to the macula densa and because of the tubulo glomerular feedback mechanism these drugs helps to improve the glomerular filtration rate and also helps to reduce the progression of the microalbuminuria to macroalbuminuria that is number 2 so we have now molecule which can be even used in non diabetic patient that we have learned 
Number two, we were not still knowing the what is the real mechanism of these drugs for the cardiac protection. But the recent data has shown that SGLT2 inhibitor directly acts on the cardiac myocytes, basically to prevent fibrosis, apoptosis, and also they inhibit the sodium hydrogen transport uh, exchanges type one, and which causes regulation of the intracellular calcium and which in fact is important for the hemodynamic changes during systole and diastole of the heart. It also improves the oxygen myocardial consumption capacity of the patients who are on diabetes with the SGLT2. So these two important mechanisms, now the final word before I close down, forget about diabetes, the breakthrough in diabetes. With the breakthrough in diabetes, we have some breakthrough in the treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with the same medicine. SGLT2, which has shown promise for the type 2 diabetes, has also shown promise to reduce the fatty liver. And there have been a lot of solid evidence doing MRI spectroscopy to quantify the liver fat. And they have shown that it reduces the liver fat content and also helpful in treating the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we know all the diabetics to some extent have some element of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So what we have learned in today's scenario that these molecules, liver molecules, apart from helping the diabetes, they are also having pleiotropic effect, also helping to reduce the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So there has been a 360 degree change in the treatment paradigm in the technology innovations in the monitoring innovation, which has gone a long way in helping our patient to treat their diabetes well. And hopefully in near future, we'll give a quality life to all the diabetic patients and we can reduce the burden of the micro and macro complication in near future. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Subhashar.